as I'm just about to start to say that um, the minute I looked at this title slide, I realized that perhaps what is more accurate is to talk about teacher education in pandemic times, the Singaporean experience, simply because I think at this moment as I'm speaking, um, Singapore is suddenly having to battle a sudden surge in infections. No doubt it's still um, way below 20 every day, but we have learned from the experience of last year that you can't take anything for granted. So I'd like to share with everyone that this is really a work in progress, meaning that we really are very much still in pandemic times and we are sharing with you our journey as we are going through it, literally. So what have we seen in the last year or so? We've really seen that we have had worldwide disruptions, of, co of course, not least, due to the earlier fourth industrial revolution and currently the COVID-19 pandemic. And these numbers, I have just checked for the updates. There are more, more than 800 million jobs that have been displaced. And today's number for people infected will be 153 million people. What have these worldwide disruptions revealed about education systems? Firstly, that perhaps we are not as prepared as we would like to be for the multiple disruptions that we suddenly find ourselves faced within. We perhaps are not as robust and resilient enough as we want to be or need to be. Thirdly, something very real, and that is that perhaps a lot of inequality in our jurisdictions has been exposed, whether we like it or not. And it really is something that we need to face. What do we make? How do we make sense of all these disruptions? Well, our current Minister for Education, Mr. Lawrence Wong, who is also the chairman of the multi-ministerial task force to take care of the COVID-19 pandemic, has this to say about seizing hold of opportunities amidst disruptions. And I quote, in the midst of crisis, we are seizing opportunities to reshape our education system for the longer term and to accelerate improvements in the way we teach and the way we learn, unquote. To summarize, we do need to, as educators, seize hold of opportunities amidst the challenges and disruptions that we face. Strengthen the foundations that, that have put us in a very good position and to build on these so it doesn't mean that just because we're facing a pandemic right now that we throw away the baby out with the bathwater, but think about the fundamentals that have been going well and continue to build on these strengths. Secondly, we need to seize the opportunity to rethink our systems and make them even more resilient, more nimble, and even more innovative. Because surprise, it changed the way we live, the way we work, the way we learn overnight and forever, so it seems. Thirdly, even as we rethink our education systems, this process of rethinking needs to be highly contextual, suited to the context within which we work. What do we need to rethink about education paradigms for the future? Well, if you look at three Lists produced in 2015, 2020, and 2025, envisioning the top 10 skills that employers want as articulated by the World Economic Forum in the years 2016, 2018, and 2020. In green, you see the similar repeated in all three cycles. But what is very noticeable about the 2025 articulation is the envisioning of the top skill being analytical thinking and innovation. And the second most sought after skill is active learning and learning strategies. Then the theme about complex problem solving that appeared in 2015 and 2020 reappear. So like it or not, international think tanks have rethought about the top 10 skills, the top five skills that employers would want for future employees in post-pandemic times. 
and referring to the OECD Education 2030 framework, the definition of competence is, and I quote, the concept of competency implies more than just the acquisition of knowledge and skills. It involves the mobilization of knowledge, skills, and values to meet complex demands. Future-ready students will need both broad as well as deep specialized knowledge, unquote. So here you see the definition of competence encompassing at least four dimensions, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values. The OECD Education 2030 framework also talks about further um, further iterating the transformative competencies that are needed for 2030. The first transformative competency is that of creating new value. What does this mean? It means that to achieve stronger, more inclusive and more sustainable development, there is a need to creatively think and develop innovations to offer vital solutions to economic social and cultural dilemmas. Secondly, there is a need for us also to reconcile tensions and dilemmas. This means that we need to be system thinkers who think and act in a more integrated way, to take into account the connections, the interconnections and interrelations between contradictory or incompatible ideas, logics, and positions from both a short as well as a long-term perspective. Thirdly, we also need to th take responsibility if we want to create new value. And to do that, we need to possess a sense of responsibility, moral, as well as intellectual maturity, and to accept accountability for our own actions and to be able to reflect and evaluate the consequences of our action. So what does rethinking education paradigms for the future look like in terms of crisis education? According to an article by Kitman and Chang, we looked at aspects of future-ready education encompassing 21st century competencies. And when we talk about education in times of crisis, we really are looking at addressing the whole issue of misinformation, because in other words, fake news, and how do we help people to make sense of what is real and what is not real? And fourthly, it is also important that social learning, even in online platforms, is a necessary element of continuing learning and education. We move on now to the next slide, where I wanted to talk about three elements of transformative competencies, I believe. Okay, and to continue about three ways that the coronavirus pandemic could reshape education, according to Tam and Al Ajar. First of all, we need to use educational innovations as catalysts to help us to think about how to learn in a lifestyle with 5G. Ironically, that was at the point when I was trying to make this point that I was thrown out of Zoom. Okay, and there are also challenges of dealing with learning and interacting on an online, even a 5G platform, right? Next, we talk about the quality of learning and digital access. We need to be able to handle people who come from the less affluent, who are at risk and less digitally savvy families, for example. Third and most importantly, we need to continue to build public and private partnerships so that we can upscale the quality of digital access even through whatever means that we can have through these partnerships so that people who are less advantaged or disadvantaged can have access to digital technology. Next. When we look at seven equity considerations for schools, we need to focus on seven main principles that we have here on screen. 
Okay. And the first is really about providing digital tools and internet capabilities to students and families in need, which takes off very nicely from the point of my last slide before this. Secondly, it is also about providing other forms of materials to keep learning going no matter the circumstance. In other words, even if you're teaching on a digital platform, there might be in some jurisdictions that we have observed the need to provide hard copy materials in case digital access is interrupted or in the worst cases, not available. Thirdly, we need to provide continued learning and digital support to children with special education needs. Now, this is a real challenge. In the case of Singapore, when there was a school closure for close to two months last year, we allowed special children with special education needs to still report to schools. Completely socially distanced because sometimes in mainstream schools, you really are looking at just one or two kids per class. But teachers would go back to schools physically, even in lockdown periods, just to see to the continuation of learning for students with special education needs. Fourthly, we need to ensure that there are wraparound services that are provided by partners. Many of these partners are private partners. And that also loops back to the previous point of the importance of public-private partnership. Fifthly, it is not just about ad adapting and adopting technology, but teachers need to be able to adopt appropriate digital teaching and learning practices. This is extremely important in order to ensure that learning continues in a meaningful way. Sixthly, we need to monitor the mental and emotional health and mental well-being of students and teachers, which we have noticed has taken a large beating in pandemic times. We need not to take this for granted and to check in on teachers and students consistently. Seventh, we do need to interact with parents to manage their expectations about what we can and cannot achieve through distance learning. Next. When schools reopen, Professor Linda Darling-Hammond et al. has offered us a framework to think about restarting and reinventing schools. She come, they've come up with 10 points that adds to this framework. Firstly, the need to close the digital divide if it exists in our individual context. Secondly, we need to strengthen both distance as well as blended learning. And this has to continue because we do not know when the occasion might call for us to have to engage in blended learning, home-based learning, whatever we may call it, because anytime there could be a surge in infections. Thirdly, we need to critically assess what students need during their learning to keep their learning going during these times. Fourthly, we need to ensure support for social and emotional learning. Again, the point about emotional and mental well-being is being seen to and talked about. Fifthly, we need to provide expanded learning time. Many of us as educators are guilty of this. We think that a one hour live lecture can take place in exactly the same period in a virtual platform. But very often you find that that's not true. You, you probably have to break the content up into at least three or four discrete units and deliver it in bite-sized pieces because our learner's attention span is really quite different in an online platform. Sixthly, we need to emphasize authentic as well as culturally responsive learning, just as we would in a face-to-face -face environment. Seven, we now know that we need to redesign schools for stronger than ever partnerships with stakeholders in the community, outside of the immediate school context in order to keep learning going uninterrupted. Eight, we need to establish community schools and wrap around support in order for learning to continue. Ninth, we need to prepare our educators. And as teacher educators, that is a very big responsibility. If we want to reinvent schools, we first need to reinvent 
our teacher education programs. And finally, we need to leverage on more adequate and equitable school funding across the board. Next, in our local context, we have done what we call a local education synthesis of past research projects that we have done through the Ministry of Education's competitive research funding. And this local education synthesis was about teacher learning. And in this local synthesis report, our Office of Education Research has come up with four enablers that can transform teachers into agents of systemic change or systemic change. Firstly, teachers need to understand and assume their roles as professionals and experts in pedagogical content knowledge. They need to own that space. Secondly, teachers need to share and collaborate with their peers in an active learning culture in the schools. Thirdly, teachers need to design and make use of resources provided within a strong curriculum framework, but ultimately they are the designers of their own learning environments. And fourthly, teachers also need to have a capacity to design for positive outcomes to be achieved through their teaching and learning endeavors. Moving on to the next slide. The roles our educators have has also been changing. And this was noted just last year. You can see that a teacher is not just, I suppose, a transmitter of knowledge or a facilitator of learning, but has assumed the following additional three roles minimally, as a social worker, as a healthcare worker, someone who is able to recognize very quick signs that their child or their pupil in their class is unwell. And of, of course, when all schools are closed, you need to be able to sort out your own IT problems because there is no IT department to speak of if we are going into pandemic times and lockdown periods. And the social worker aspect, as I mentioned, is extremely important to take care of the mental well-being of our peers as well as our learners. Next, in order to weather educational changes, our colleagues have come up with the five C's of schooling. Those of you who are familiar with the Singapore context will know that the typical five C's had always to do with aspirational material needs. But the five C's of schooling are altogether spelling something very different. The first C is character and citizenship education. The next C is creative thinking. The third C is about critical thinking. The fourth C is about cultivating a sense of compassion for each other in difficult times. And the fifth C is to stay connected, both literally, literally as well as figuratively, when we are in distanced environments and cannot meet face to face. To, to further articulate this, I have a quote. Next slide. Every teacher is a CCE teacher, and every teacher role models and teaches creative and critical thinking. Likewise, the teacher needs to exemplify connectedness as well as compassion towards their students." Unquote. So you see the new five C's of schooling that my colleagues have articulated in pandemic times. Now, I would like to turn your attention towards universal quality education. How do we achieve this? Firstly, we need to support caregivers at home who help children to learn while schools are closed. This is extremely important. And there were many memes going around in social media where parents really were literally tearing their hair out and saying thank you to the teachers because they, they only have two or three children at home to deal with and they cannot imagine if they have to face a classroom of 40 students. Secondly, as schools reopen, educators need to use low stake assessments to identify the learning gaps that need to be filled when learning was taking place in a virtual platform. And thirdly, we also need to tailor children's instructions to help them master foundational skills if 
indeed we have identified any learning gaps that need to be bridged. I would now like to talk about reimagining the future of skills. What is it that young people will need? Firstly, they need modern skills, not old fashioned curricula that we've been delivering. Secondly, soft skills are key to survival in post pandemic times. Thirdly, of course, now more than ever, we need to have digital connectivity and to conduct digital learning. Fourthly, and this has come to the fore very, very strongly, that we need to reach out to vulnerable communities within our individual jurisdiction. A very recent article by Linda Dar darling Hammond and Hyler, published in 2021, talks about more cognitive and metacognitive strategies that's focused on deeper learning. And how do they define deeper learning? Well, it is still perhaps very much back to the basics, except emerging even deeper, which is, one, continue to invest in high quality teacher preparation. Secondly, to transform educator learning opportunities to match current needs. Really, again, about rethinking teacher education. Thirdly, we need to support our teachers in their new mentoring roles and all the other roles that we articulated as social workers, healthcare workers, IT support personnel. And fourthly, to do this, we need to create even more opportunities for collaboration. So that was a very wide sweep of the literature that talks about education in COVID-19 and post pandemic times. Now, I'd like to bring you back to the Singapore context. We start with the beginning, where our founding late Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, had this to say, and I quote, well, finally, just as a country is as good as its citizens, so its citizens are really only as good as their teachers. From the time we were founded and gained our independence as a city, state, nation and country, teachers have always been viewed as nation builders who shape the future of our nation one student at a time. And that message has been unwavering and continues even to the present. I will now move on to how I've articulated how we think about teacher education in Singapore. I must admit, that I'm building on the good work that my predecessors have started since the first few deans of Professor Gopinathan to Professor Chia Honman to Professor Tan Un Singh to my immediate predecessor, Associate Professor Liu Wun Chia. There are, according to what I've seen, three anchors of teacher education. Perhaps the third is something that I need to take on as a baton to run with. Firstly, our first anchor is always to be values-driven. Our second anchor is to be evidence-informed. And our third anchor is and continues to be being future-focused. I would now like to start with the first anchor, being values-driven. Our latest, if you ask us what we're doing right now as we speak, we are in the process of setting up a center for character and citizenship education because the important message is that every teacher is a CCE teacher, CCE standing for character and citizenship education. We have also introduced a new mandatory CCE course for all our student teachers across our initial teacher preparation programs in tandem with the new CCE curriculum that has been launched in schools this year. Thirdly, if you look on the top right, we have always been guided by our VQSK model, which stands for values, skills, and knowledge, which is that it is a schematized DNA model where the three-pronged set of values has wrapped around it skills and knowledge of the 21st 
century, which are wrapped around the three value paradigms of values, learner-centeredness, a strong sense of teacher identity or pride, and thirdly, service to growing the fraternity of teachers or mentorship. So this is our values paradigm in terms of delivering our teacher education framework. Currently, our thinking is the expanding environment framework for values education, which I would have time to articulate in the next few slides. I'll come back to the fourth slide. I will now move on to the next slide, which is to introduce you to NIE's and Singapore's vision for teacher education, which is a pun on for life, which is F-O-R, as well as four lives. So what do we mean by the four lives? Teacher education should be lifelong in that there must be multiple pathways for teacher learning that continues across the continuum of a teacher's lifelong career growth, beginning from pre-service to the point when they are beginning on novice teachers, all the way to when they become professional teachers. The next life is about being life deep. We need to deepen our professional expertise. And to do this, we have introduced the digital portfolio, which allows our student teachers to integrate and aggregate their learning experiences. It is meant to serve as a learning portfolio whilst they're with us at the NIE or pre-service. It serves as a showcasing portfolio when they're out in their final practicum. And it is the beginnings of their professional teaching portfolio when they graduate uh, from NIE and become beginning teachers in our schools. Thirdly, it is, it is about life-wise education. Teacher education is about building the professional ethos and values of our teachers. In short, we call this in Singapore, building teacher personhood via strengthening the values-based components in our program and having strong personalized mentorship for all our student teachers. Last but not least, it is about life-wide education. Teacher education must be multimodal and provide multiple perspectives for our student teachers. These perspectives have to be both local as well as global, and it has to transcend both digital and multimodal literacies. It now gives me great pleasure to talk to you about NIE's values-based expanding environment framework. First, I'd like to direct you to the compass pointing to the true north. The spine of our values education model is the importance of character and citizenship education. The expand, expanding environment framework begins with myself. And how do we do this? When our student teachers enter into NIE, they all go through a personal and professional journey known as the Maranti Project. The Maranti Project gets its name from a very hard, resilient tree known as the Maranti tree that produces wood that is extremely hard and extremely resilient to symbolize the type of teachers that we need in present pandemic times and beyond. Someone who is resilient, able to weather the good times and the bad times, times when there's plenty of sunshine, plenty of rain and periods of drought as well, harsh weather conditions. Emanating from myself is my community. Every single of our student teachers and your Dean, Professor Lynn Goodwin, would be able to tell you about this because she has personally experienced this, goes through what we call a community involvement project or a values in action community project, where they spend at least 20 hours mingling with a community of their choice and producing some kind of deliverable at the end of that interaction. So to give you a concrete example, and the facilitators are faculty members who journey with our student teachers. To give you an example of a project which I led, my group worked with the Retinitis Pigmentosa Society, 
referring to a debilitating eye disease that affects about 1% of Singapore's population. They raised about 5,500 Singapore dollars in order to purchase assistive technology that can help the sufferers of this disease to enlarge print up to 60 times in order to be able to read print painstakingly one letter at a time. The other thing that they did was to work with professional ophthalmologists to come up with a brochure that increases public awareness for sufferers of this disease because 1% may not be a lot, but it is still a significant proportion of Singapore's population that suffers from this disease. And their aim was to promote public awareness of this disease. Emanating from my community is my nation. Our student teachers all take a compulsory course known as Singapore Kaleidoscope. It is not a lecture tutorial style course. Instead, it makes use of appreciative inquiry that allows our student teachers to appreciate the ethnic and cultural heritage of our nation. And at the end of it, simply to produce an artifact reflecting their appreciation of Singapore's culture and heritage. We have compiled wonderful creations from our students in the form of a hard copy um, coffee table book, which I can easily make available in an online platform if you like, after the lecture. And finally, of course, my world. We do feel that our student teachers need to be exposed to the international practicum and international semester exchange abroad, as well as overseas experiences in service and leadership training, which we call SALT for short. Now, all this is very well articulated on paper, but what happens when international borders close? So that is something that Dean, Lynn Goodwin and I have debated long and hard about. In the end, we as university administrators thought that if we organize international webinars, perhaps there might be a lot of traction to learn about each other's education systems, get a very fancy professor to talk to them about education systems in both countries. Guess what? Our student teachers are not interested in that sort of exchange. Instead, they requested to connect at a student to student level. And we have done so, we have paired up Hong Kong U students with NIE student teachers and they interact on their own, they conduct their own Zoom meetings, very much student-led, student-driven, and they talk about anything that they'd like. Yes, they do talk about the education system amidst food and other cultural experiences. They share even about the types of ethnic attire that they wear, the type of food that they cook. So it is re really quite interesting what this kind of international exchange looks like in pandemic times. And we've all had to really recreate what it means when you talk about international practicum and international semester exchange when all international borders are closed. My next slide would like to talk a little bit about the new character and citizenship education course that we are enacting for our student teachers. Well, to begin, to begin with, we do not see this as just a standalone course. So the main spine, which is represented by the pencil, is really the new character and citizenship education course, which is only about 26 hours, that tells our student teachers the what, the why, and the how of enacting CCE in the classroom. But we see it as a wrap around a total approach, holistic approach, where all the other components I spoke about just now, which is the values-based components in our program, such as the Maranti project, the service learning project, the Singapore Kaleidoscope project, the teaching practicum is also about building a good citizen and character in the classroom. And we have a whole host, like any other teacher ed program, of education studies courses that also belong to this basket of strengthening character and citizenship education in our initial teacher preparation programs. Next, we also need to infuse character and citizenship education components in our teaching methodology courses 
which tends to be subject and domain specific, it is important to use relevant examples in our language classrooms, in our history, social studies classrooms, in order for CCE to come alive. And our next immediate task is to work on the mother tongue language specialists and to strengthen the CCE offerings within the specialization as well. And that we're hoping to accomplish by the end of the year. I now come to my second anchor, evidence-informed teacher education. I'm just doing a very quick time check. I think we're doing quite well for time. 15 more minutes, right? Okay, so I would now talk to you about how we articulate what we mean by research evidence informing teacher education programs. Next slide. Here, you would see a suite of research projects on building an evidence base for teacher education, which I have led and which Dean Lynn Goodwin has just talked about, that where she features as a prominent collaborator and co-PI in many of these projects, together with a team comprising key senior level personnel from the Ministry of Education, we've been able to provide evidence-informed design and delivery of our programs, such that our research evidence informs our teacher education programs and also helps us to form new questions that helps us to build another cycle of research evidence that can help us to strengthen and to literally think out of the box for what's the next wave when we talk about redesigning teacher education programs. To give you a bit more specific, the next slide. Our suite of seven projects starting from the year 2009 focuses really on teacher education from initial teacher preparation all the way to teachers' career-long development. Some of our findings include the need to continually strengthen the theory practice nexus, something that we all know in university-based teacher education models. We need to find more opportunities for authentic learning experiences for our pre-service student teachers. Contract teaching experiences, known also as the compulsory teaching stint, makes a difference on our pre-service student teachers' learning experience. We also need to have more support for beginning teachers, we need structured mentoring programs that work better for beginning teachers rather than unstructured ad hoc versions. And currently, as a status update, we are currently studying the impact of our enhanced 16-month PGDE programs that have been introduced since 2016. So what is the impact on our teacher education programs? The findings have informed the enhancements of our Teaching Scholars Program, as well as our recently enhanced 16-month PGDE program. Our Teacher Leaders Program has also been helped by this series of evidence-based studies that can help us to mentor junior as well as beginning teachers. With regard to the impact on policy, because we have partnered with senior stakeholders from the Ministry of Education, our findings are able to help us to really talk about providing a compulsory teaching stint for all uh, postgraduate diploma and education student teachers, all pre-service teachers for that matter, and more schools are now assigning protected time for mentoring and lesson observations to support beginning teachers. Next slide. As Dean, I also lead what we call the TPAL TE Steering Committee, standing for Teacher Professionalism and Learning, as well as Teacher Education. What I do is to oversee the strategy, research and development, and translation of the program on teacher professional learning into our teacher education programs. I also ensure that the fourth tranche of funding from the Ministry of Education's strategic goals have been achieved. And finally, I try to ensure the translation of the findings from the third tranche into our teacher education programs. 
for this particular committee. I chair this and we meet once in every two months. And perennially, we also present our findings on the impacts on policy as well as practice to our Ministry of Education stakeholders. Next, I will now talk about the third anchor. What does it mean to be future focused? I have about 10 minutes and I do believe I should be able to complete this. Now, President of the National University of Singapore was interviewed by the Straits Times, Singapore's local newspaper, on the 10th of September. And he has this to say about how the pandemic has changed our education landscape. He says that the pandemic is more than a medical issue. It has ramifications on our society, politics, economy, and the local and global environment. In the past, we always talk about universities providing specializations, depth of knowledge. But in the future, all universities need interdisciplinarity, flexibility, and lifelong learning opportunities. And all the institutes of higher learning, and I would speak very strongly for both the National University of Singapore as well as Nanyang Technological University, has fundamentally reinvented the way that we organize our undergraduate education. We now talk about an interdisciplinary collaborative core known as ICC for short, which is compulsory courses spanning topics like digital literacy, health, wellness, well-being, and so on and so forth, computational thinking, issues that confronted us as we faced the pandemic. Right? And this is the same for the National University of Singapore as well. And finally, the type of faculty that we need, need to now have not just the depth, but the breadth of knowledge as well. Because in order to really be able to get us out of pandemic times, we need agile solvers of wicked problems, such as the pandemic that we face, that are ill-defined, mutating all the time, and that transcend disciplinary boundaries and establish bodies of knowledge as we know it. So if we were to extrapolate that to the type of teacher educators that we need, it would not differ. We need faculty who have both the depth and breadth of knowledge, people willing to be reinvented almost overnight in order to broaden their field of expertise to be able to, to deliver the type of teacher education that is life-changing, earth-shaking, world-changing that we need to get us through pandemic and post-pandemic times. Next. We look at the changing operating context around us, right? We look at rapid technological change and disruptions, including the pandemic. We look at higher public expectation and and aspirations of education. We look at aging population and falling cohort sizes, at least in Singapore. We look at the economic weight shifts to Asia. We look at inequality and mobility as a growing social, societal concern. And we look at a more diverse society with much more diverse needs coming to the fore, such as special education needs. So in Singapore, we have three main thrusts that we are thinking about. Firstly, there is the Nanyang Technological University's Education 2025 initiative. And we have the Ministry of Education's Learn for Life Remaking Pathways initiative. And many of the other opportunities and challenges, depending on how you view them, that now form collectively the operating context for teacher education. What does this mean for teacher education? Well, I'd like to share with you the next slide, which I like to call frequently as the future ready wheel, called the future ready wheel for teacher education. I was rather pleased with this diagram until one day I opened a packet of Frosties and realized that if you turn behind to the nutritional value, you would see the nutritional wheel looking very uh, very much like this 
uh, future ready wheel that I've articulated for teacher education. And that is, I suppose, because we have a lot of stock images that you that are royalty free. Okay, so what do we mean by future ready teachers in terms of our teacher education program? This was slightly before pandemic time, so I'll, sh I'll share some of these with you, really giving you one example per segment. Rigorous programs is really about building and continuing to build a strong theory practice nexus in our programs. Next, we move on to innovative pedagogies. I mean, what is innovative today can very quickly become obsolete tomorrow. The world has now realized very quickly and overnight that innovative pedagogies include the ability to conduct virtual lessons even when all schools are physically closed, right? And what are the best ways to engage students in an online learning platform? That is a topic of many conferences and many webinars because people are all interested to keep education going. Multiple perspectives, I touched a little bit on this. Uh, we talk about providing both local as well as educational exp um, experiences abroad, both in physical as well as virtual platforms. But we also talk about teacher education that needs to take place outside of physical campus classrooms. So this would involve, uh, for example, the community involvement projects I talked to you about, as well as building university interns for leadership development. So we believe in internships for our student teachers beyond the realms of educational domains. Professional practice, we believe in two very uh, important pillars of teacher education. And that would be the digital portfolio, which I mentioned, is meant to integrate and aggregate our student teachers learning whilst they're with us. And also the importance of the clinical practice can never be overemphasized because really it is about exposing our student teachers to the realities of the classroom. And these days, the realities of the classroom include the virtual classroom as well. And lastly, it is again about building teacher professionalism through teacher personhood, building a strong sense of ethos and professionalism. Very quickly, I'm going to go through my next few slides. Next slide. What was our approach for teacher education um, in the last year? Well, firstly, we had to go 100% online and had to have virtual platforms that had to be ready, whether we liked it or not, for what we call the lockdown period in Singapore last year, known as the circuit breaker period. We also needed to revamp our teaching practicum to ensure the enactment and even the assessment of virtual lessons. Thirdly, we had a mixed modality final practicum posting, which was terrifying, not just for the student teachers, but for the teacher educators, where our student teachers were out on their final practicum, all 344 of them, on a 55% face-to-face or five and a half weeks face-to-face -face, and four and a half weeks of home-based learning being attached to cooperating teachers who frankly were themselves struggling to survive. Fourthly, we needed to use virtual platforms to engage our partner organizations for both the internship programs as well as service learning component. And this is very difficult when you think about connecting activities you know, in a very interactive way and meaningful way. How can service learning be meaningful even in a virtual platform? Fifthly, we conducted a lot of virtual international exchanges, and I shared this earlier using Hong Kong University and the NIE as a very good example of what we think our students want and what our students really want. And finally, we need to envisage what the collaborative and virtually open classroom of the future would look like. And this is a project that we are doing. We are allowing our heads of academic groups to weigh in on how they think our current classrooms need to move and be redesigned in order to allow them to teach virtually, even in physical spaces. Next. Here are some of the broad ideas which I think I would need the next few years, at least up to perhaps five years, to reimagine teacher education in Singapore. Firstly, we need to articulate the archetype of the future-ready teacher. I think Lynn, Dean Lynn Goodwin has heard a lot about our value, skills, and knowledge model, but that is already 10 years old. We now need to update it 
and to articulate the archetype of the future ready teacher that has come very much to the fore in the last year. Secondly, through my Dean's Tea with my student teachers, I realized that greater learner agency and flexibility in our teacher education programs is pressing. Our student teachers want a voice and autonomy in designing their programs. So the idea is what do we put into a common core and what can we make as being optional and self-designed and student teacher led. Thirdly, as already mentioned, our programs need to be a lot more interdisciplinary and not just have people from different disciplines in that particular course that is very different. And all of this, of course, leads us to talk about having to reimagine, restructure and to streamline our teacher education programs. To do this, we need to work very closely with our stakeholders, the Ministry of Education, that will be receiving the products of our teacher education into the schools in Singapore. Exciting times, but a lot of work. I now move on to show you the tree of life, if you like, representing the Learn for Life initiative, introduced by the Ministry of Education, and there is a link for you. We have redrawn the tree and the components so that we don't breach copyright. So what does the soil represent? The soil represents the basic purpose of education, which is to ensure that education is, a, is an uplifting force in society. Secondly, the roots represent the need to hold on to our roots. In Singapore, we talk about the roots as our language education policy, which is about English knowing bilingualism, where English connects us to the rest of the world, but our bilingual education policy allows us to still have a cultural balance through our ethnic languages that link us to our mother tongue. Thirdly, the trunk of the tree represents structural change that needs to take place. That is to reignite the joy of learning in our students in schools. To do this, we need to recalibrate the overemphasis on assessment to bring out the joy of learning. Fourthly, it is really about taking great structural changes. You have read about this in the media. We are going to full subject-based banding and abandoning the sacred cows of academic streaming. We are now also restructuring the way that we think and represent the primary school leaving examination results. Fifthly, the tree, the fruits of the tree represents always thinking of refreshing our curriculum, like fresh fruits that grow in spring. And finally, the sun represents strong support for our educators as they need to reinvent themselves or to keep reinventing themselves in order to stay relevant for the future. So it brings me now to my second last slide. What does this skills future for educators look like? Six priority areas have been articulated beautifully by teachers for teachers. It was through focus group discussions with teachers who felt that they needed continual professional learning in six priority, priority areas, including character and citizenship education, special education needs, inquiry-based learning, differentiated instruction, assessment literacy, and e-pedagogy. At the exit of initial teacher preparation, our teachers need to emerge with what we call emergent levels of practice in all of these six areas. Then, together with the Ministry of Education, NIE will work with MOE, the Academy of Singapore Teachers and the schools to conduct continual lifelong professional development for our teachers in all three, all six areas so that it can reach the proficient, accomplished and leading levels of practice in all of the six areas. Finally, I'd like to end with a quote of deep reflection of what really is the raison d'etre of all educators in pandemic times. I have been invited, as I believe Dean Goodwin would also be, to speak at many international platforms about education 
in pandemic and post-pandemic times. So for me, the role of all educators in pandemic times is to keep learning going no matter when, no matter what, and no matter how. And at this juncture, I feel that it is fitting for me to end my lecture with a salute to all teachers, not just in Singapore, but around the world. So I hope that you would appreciate this video that was really prepared to celebrate Teachers' Day in October 2020, to acknowledge the hard work, hard work and hard work that our teachers all over the world have had to play in the last year and beyond. So please enjoy the video. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to class. The previous lesson... The schools may have all been closed. And we learned that the plates actually move due to the high... The classrooms may have all been empty. But all across the country, minds were still eager to learn. And teachers were still eager to teach. Through the crisis, the lessons continued. Through the hardships, our educators innovated. And now that our institutions of education have reopened, our teachers continue to find new ways to adapt their lessons to this new environment. Teachers of Singapore, we salute you. Thank you very much, everyone, for your kind attention, and I'm very happy to pass this uh, session over for the Q&A.